And so now we're going to consider in this lecture um, the modern view, or at least one of the prevailing modern views of the Old Testament canon. Um, <clears throat> if you took an introduction to the Old Testament course today, what, what a, a modern professor might teach about the pr uh, formation of the canon is going to look very different from that account that we gave, the more traditional account, all right? So when he comes to answer the question, how did we get uh, the Old Testament, he's going to be uh, sort of approaching that question with certain assumptions, certain presuppositions. Um, so, for example, these would include uh, many modern professors would have a bias against the supernatural, all right? So they're going to read the Old Testament Scriptures, and they're going to just read it as, you know, the product of just natural uh, development um, without God's intervention. They would be inclined towards evolution. And you might say, well, what does that have to do with, you know, the development of the canon? Well, they take the sort of scheme of evolution that's normally, in our minds, applied to biology, uh, and they apply it to the development of religion. And we're going to talk about that shortly, but basically the idea that religion starts off very primitive, and then it develops over time, and then they apply that to the religion in the Old Testament. Thirdly, they have this assumption that Hebrew literacy, you know, the, the knowledge of, of writing, the ability to write, that that's something that developed very late in the ancient Near East, including among Hebrews. So they're very doubtful of early Hebrew literacy. And then fourthly, they're critical of the Bible's inspiration and its reliability. Um, and so they come to the Bible with a very sort of a critical mindset. So let's kind of, you know, fill each of these out a little bit and talk about them. So first of all, their assumption is that they are biased against the supernatural. You see this, um, you know, especially in the, the 19th century. Um, some of these Old Testament scholars come to the Old Testament and they say, well, instead of uh, ascribing this to the activity of God, inspiring individuals and so on, the supernatural activity, let's just kind of view it as just like we would any, any other religion that develops among human societies. Somebody gets the bright idea that they're going to put down in writing their thoughts about what God is like and what God is communicating to people. And so that's what men like Abraham Kinnon uh, advocate. He's a Dutch scholar, and, and in, his, uh, in this book edited by Orr, Problem of the Old Testament, uh, Kinnon says this, he says, So soon as we derive a separate part of Israel's religious life directly from God and allow the supernatural or immediate revelation to intervene in even one single point, so long also our view of the whole continues to be incorrect. All right, so basically what he's saying is traditional scholars have it all wrong. They've been misreading the Old Testament. And so therefore, he says, it is the supposition of a natural development alone which accounts for all the phenomena that we find in the Hebrew Bible. All right, so that, that's how you and I have to approach it, is just read this as we would any other simple religious book. Furthermore, there's this idea of the evolution of religion. Okay, and again, this sort of is based in some of the thought of Charles Darwin, where Darwin, of course, is primarily concerned with the origin of species. How did all of the animal life on earth come into being? How did it develop over time? And of course, he applied this even to humans. Well, many modern scholars got the bright idea that they could just apply that same scheme to religion. All right, so you have primates, and when you're, when you're talking about primates, primates don't really have any religion, right? I mean, you and I don't usually see National Geographic documentaries which a bunch, with a bunch of chimpanzees sitting around a, an altar um, while one of them's preaching, right? Or they're not singing hymns, as far as we know. Um, but at some point, you know, men became or these primates became homo sapiens, which that term just means, you know, wise human, um, and then began uh, the very incipient idea of religion itself. And it first began as what we know as animism. Okay, do you know what animism means? Animism is the idea that, that there's some kind of deity or spirit 
in things, created things like trees, uh, rocks, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe the moon or the stars, all right? Um, you know, by the way, I can kind of see how you might say, well, there's a, a God in the tree, because what happens at times when you look at a tree, you see the, the, the leaves moving, right? But you look at a rock and you say, well, why would you think there's a, a God in that rock? Okay, but that, basically the idea of animism is, is that, you know, deity resides or spirits reside in, you know, created things. By the way, you see this even when you go up north to Alaska and you see totem poles. Um, and those creatures on the totem pole are supposed to represent different deities that inhabit different facets of creation. Well, then over time, religion kept developing, and then you had the rise of polytheism. And polytheism is the idea that, okay, well, no longer do we want to just simply, you know, uh, confine the gods to created things, but now they might exist separately, but there's many of them. Poly means many. There are many gods. And you know, most of us are familiar with the fact that in the Old Testament times or the biblical times, polytheism is, is often addressed and often condemned. You know, the pagans have many gods. But then over time, uh, eventually monotheism began, and that's the notion that there just is one supreme God. Uh, and so the argument from these modern scholars is that the monotheism we find in the Old Testament is a late development in Old Testament religion. And so they want to take the Old Testament and take most of the Old Testament and assign it to a very late period in history. All right, We normally think of the Old Testament uh, beginning in the second millennium B.C., all right? It would have been like around the 14, 1500s when Moses was around, okay? And Abraham was even before that. Abraham would have started back in the, the third millennium B.C., okay? Um, but they're wanting to argue, no, 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 let's push it all way late into the first millennium, all right? That's when that monotheism began to develop and come into being. Uh, and so keep this in mind, because they're going to try to apply this grid then to the way that they view the development of the Old Testament canon, and, and we'll see this as we go on. The third assumption is the late development of Hebrew literacy, all right? So in the mind of many modern scholars, it all starts with oral tradition, okay? And, and you've seen those movies sometimes where you have a sage sitting by a fire, a campfire, and there's a bunch of people surrounding him, and he's basically telling stories, stories about their ancestors, stories about their traditions, okay? And these stories are, are, are memorized, and they're passed down from generation to generation. Well, then at a later time, <clears throat> you, you, you had individuals that begin to put this into writing. Oh, so writing would have been viewed as a later development than oral tradition. The question is, you know, when? When, in their minds, did written tradition begin? Well, many modern scholars placed it around 1000 B.C. So if you know your chronology pretty well, you know that would be around the time of David and Solomon. Okay, so in their minds, writing really didn't begin until David or Solomon. Before that, everything was passed down word of mouth. After that, you had uh, written tradition beginning among the Hebrew peoples. And then fourthly, they were very critical of the Bible's inspiration and reliability. You had um, the modernist view, which basically arose in the, uh, you know, during the time of the Enlightenment, uh, 18th century, 19th century, early 20th century. This view denies anything supernatural. It sees the Bible as reflecting the religious thoughts of ancient writers, which may contain abiding principles of truth and religious value. So if you read, by the way, uh, religious literature from the early 20th century, they wax eloquent when they're talking about the golden rule or, you know, some of the Ten Commandments and, and all of these things they see as very valuable for us, okay? But um, they're very critical of the Bible as well, and they reject huge parts of it, okay, because they, they reject the supernatural and inspiration. Later on, in the middle part of the 20th century, right after World War II, uh, all of a sudden, some of these modernist scholars saying, wait a minute, you know, humanity's not getting better. It's, it's really bad, right? Because Hitler, you know, is killing all these Jewish people, and 
People are, nations are still going to war, and so this idea of evolution is not working very well. And so you get some modification to the modernist view known as the neo-Orthodox view. This view does allow for some supernatural intervention in history, which is a welcome change, right? And, and, but, but it still sees the Bible as sort of fallible human reflection on God's activity in history. So, in, in a sense, the neo-Orthodox wants to have the best of both worlds, all right? It wants to have the, the religious value of the Bible that the conservative traditional view has. They want to say it's still relevant, that you still have the gospel, but then they want to be able to maintain that critical stance towards the historicity of the Bible that the modernist has. And so the bottom line in both of these views is that the Bible is fundamentally a human product and as a result, it contains human errors. So those are the assumptions. How does that affect the way that they describe the development of the Old Testament? Okay. Well, let me give you one of their representatives. This is uh, Herbert E. Ryle. Does anyone know who his father was? J.C. Ryle. So this is J.C. Ryle's son. And unfortunately, the son did not follow the father in this case. So if you read his book on the canon of the Old Testament, he wants to argue that the law, the book of Moses, was really not written by Moses, but was written by someone else. It was completed and canonized around 400 B.C. Okay. Um, then he wants to argue that the prophets were completed and canonized around 200 B.C. Okay, now notice, remember, the traditional view says it was in the 400s. So he's going to be pushing the prophets later, and we're going to talk about why he does that. And then he's going to say the writings were completed, and they, they were really not canonized till after the time of Christ, A.D. 90. Okay. So you can see how the modern view has taken a lot of the writings of the Old Testament and has pushed them much later in history, Keep in mind that they're, they're thinking in terms of this evolutionary development and of the fact that literacy was a late development in Hebrew history. All right, so let's kind of look at these a little bit more in detail. So you have the law completed and canonized around 400 B.C. How did this kind of thinking develop? Well, in 1753, a French physician... Uh, that is a medical doctor by the name of Jean Ostruc. He published his conjectures on the original sources Moses used to compose the book of Genesis. And in that book, he defends Mosaic authorship. However, he does something that's a little bit novel, all right? He's going to spend some time arguing that Moses is using different sources to compose the Pentateuch. And he's going to try to sort of provide a basis for why it is he's conjecturing these different sources that Moses used to write. He bases his theory on multiple source, uh, of multiple sources on the presence of different names for God in the Pentateuch. Sometimes the, uh, the writer uses Yahweh. Other times he uses Elohim. Okay. Moreover, in the Pentateuch, you have seeming parallel accounts of events. So in Genesis 12, we read about Abraham taking his wife Sarah and company down to Egypt. And what's he do when they, when they get there? He tells a lie. You know, he basically, you know, uh, veils the fact that they're married and passes her off as a sister. And Pharaoh takes her and... You know, you know the rest of the story. Well, what's interesting is that if you get to chapter 20, the same thing seems to happen all over again, except this time it's in Gerar among the Philistines, but he does the same thing with his wife, Sarah. And so, you know, because of that, um, guys like Astruc is saying, well, maybe there's two sources. There's one source that, you know, took this story and, and told it this way, and another source that took it and told it that way, behind the writings of Moses. And he also talks about alleged differences in literary style of different parts, okay? And, and that's, you know, sort of giving him the idea that, well, maybe different authors contributed to the book of Genesis. Now, keep in mind that this particular scholar at this time is still defending essential Mosaic authorship. 
Okay, so he's, he, he's still saying Moses wrote this. He's still treating it, you know, as Scripture. But then time goes on, and other scholars follow him, and they begin to apply what becomes known as source criticism to the entire Pentateuch. Instead of defending Mosaic authorship, they posit different authors or authorial guilds. So an authorial guild just means like kind of a school of authors, okay? They're like followers of a particular scribe or rabbi, and they all just sort of contribute to this writing process, okay? And so this trend of positing these different sources culminates in Julius Wellhausen's prolegomena, which that word means introduction to the history of ancient Israel. He was a German scholar in the 19th century, and it was Wellhausen that popularized what's called the documentary hypothesis, also known as the JEPD theory. All right, how many of you have heard those expressions? Okay. They're almost notorious, right, um, especially among conservative circles, because uh, this theory really had a profound influence upon Old Testament scholarship. Um, in the 19th century, throughout the 20th century, and even today, it still exerts some influence. What does this theory teach? Well, basically, the idea is that there are these different writers, and, and the JEPD is an acronym that basically is sort of uh, referring to these different writers. So, first of all, you have the Yahwist. All right, I know it says J, but in German, J is pronounced Y, so it's the Yahwist. Um, the Yahwist basically did his writing around 950 BC in the southern kingdom of Judah. All right, so that would have been, you know, just around Solomon, Rehoboam's time, and so on. And uh, so he's basically writing a Jewish history, and he's giving some of his own unique perspectives. Again, I say he, but it may have been they, that is, the Yahwist Guild, all right? Well, then you also have, about a hundred years later, an individual or a group of persons uh, known as the Eloist source, and uh, they're in the northern king of Israel. By the way, why is one called the Yahwist and the other was the, the Eloist? What do you think? Okay. And so, you know, one of them is going to be referring to God as Yahweh, and the other one's going to be referring to the, uh, God as uh, Elohim. And, and can, can you already imagine what their minds are doing now as they go through the, the Law of Moses, the five books of the Pentateuch? What do you think they're looking for? Yahweh. Oh, well, that must have been one source. Oh, but over here it's Elohim. Well, that must be another source. Okay, so you see where this is going. Well, thirdly, they have the Deuteronomist, the D. That would have been written around 600 B.C. in Jerusalem during a time of religious reform. Do you, you guys know what period or what religious reform he's talking about there? He's talking about the reform under King Josiah. All right? And you remember one of the things Josiah did is he, he instructed that the, 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 the temple should be repaired, all right, the house of the Lord. And what was discovered in the temple that was in ruins? The Book of the Covenant, okay, probably the Book of Deuteronomy. And so it was brought before Josiah. Josiah had it read. And what do you suppose he heard in the Book of Deuteronomy? He, and, and this is the part that really stands out in the, in the narrative he read about, they read about the curses that would befall the nation of Israel because of their disobedience to the covenant. And he tears his clothes, and he basically prays that God might be merciful, and he realizes that a lot of the judgment Israel has been suffering has been due to their disobedience. Well, what the liberals want to say, the modernists, I should say, is that, is that that's the writing. It was found, it was staged as if it was found. It really wasn't lost, or it was, it was really, in fact, for the first time composed during Josiah's reform. In fact, that was Josiah's way of consolidating power. If he could just convince the people of Israel that, uh, you know, they needed to get their act straight, they needed to come under his leadership, uh, and he thought he could do so by presenting this book to them, the book of Deuteronomy. Okay, so that was a late development 
And then, um, even later than that, you have the priestly source. This was written by an individual who was a priest or by a group of priests around 500 B.C. during the exile in Babylon. Okay? And then finally, um, they would add to that the, the Torah redactors. Um, and, and by that, they basically, as they're looking at the law, the books of Moses, you have J.E., right? Those materials are combined. Then you have D added to it. Then finally P added to it. And then you have these editors come along called redactors, and they kind of smooth it all out, all right? They try to sort of, as it were, erase some of the seams in these sources to almost make it read as if it was written by one individual, all right? Um, Just to kind of illustrate here, all right? So you have the early oral and written sources, and then you have, you know, uh, the Yahwist and the Elohist, they're combining their materials, these are put together, and then you have added to them the Deuteronomic corpus and the priestly materials, and then you finally have something that's very close to um, the Torah. And, and, and of course, you know, in this chart it doesn't add it, but you also have to add R for redactor, because the redactors are the people who came along and, you know, sort of edited and completed it, all right? Um, Just to give you an idea how this applies to Old Testament studies. So if you're an Old Testament scholar today, you might pick up the book of Genesis, and one of your objectives would be to carefully read through the book and to identify all of the sources behind the narrative in Genesis. All right, so as you can see by this diagram I have here, I know it's a little bit blurry, but you can see that Genesis is basically um, the product of a lot of different writers, all right? And all of those writings have been spliced together, as it were, to produce the book of Genesis. And then you have Exodus. And you see there are certain sections of Exodus that are almost entirely written by the priest, priestly writers. By the way, can you guess which ones those would be? The ones that talk about the tabernacle and the furniture and the sacrifices and so on. Then you've got the book of Leviticus, who wrote most of Leviticus. That would have been the priests, all right? But again, you see a few other contributions in there, some narratives. And then you have numbers, and that's kind of a mix. And then Deuteronomy kind of stands over by itself, okay? Just imagine, seriously, just imagine what your Bible would look like if it reflected this kind of source criticism. Imagine reading through Genesis, and as you're reading through, you know, you see one paragraph that's colored... Uh, green, and another one that's colored blue, and and so on and so forth. Um, That would get very confusing after a while. Just to illustrate this further, uh, imagine that, you know, you've got these different sources, you stack them up, and then you bring these redactors along, and they want to arrange them um, in a thematic or chronological order, and so they do the editing, and then eventually you have, you know, the final product. And so what you have in your Hebrew, or I mean in your Christian Bible, Part 1, Old Testament, that's basically the final product of all of this editing of these various sources, all right? Uh, So that's basically their view of the law. You say, what are the practical implications for the historicity of the early parts of the Pentateuch? All right, so keep in mind now, guys like Wellhausen are arguing that this stuff was all initiated, uh, you know, during probably around the time of Solomon and Rehoboam, and then over time it was edited and so forth. Um, but what that means is that none of your, your, your books of Moses were written even remotely close to the time of Moses, hundreds of years later. And, and you know, they're, they're relying on a lot of oral tradition primarily. And so therefore, what does that tell us about the history we have, say, in the book of Genesis? Well, here's what Wellhausen says. He says, We attain no historical knowledge of the patriarchs, but only the time when the stories about them arose in the Israelite people. This later age is here, in the book of Genesis, unconsciously projected in its inner and its outer features into hoary antiquity, and is reflected there like a glorified mirage. I think you know what a mirage is. You know, your 
thirsty, wandering through the desert, and you think you see an oasis, and you see water, but when you get there, you find it was only an illusion. And so what these modernist scholars are telling us is that when you and I are reading um, the stories of, of Genesis, thinking that we're getting real history, what they're here to tell you is that it's all just a mirage. 